Hey, hello there. It's Maria Watton here, Storyteller. Welcome to World Storytelling Cafe. I told some stories, I think it was about two weeks ago. If you want to go back and look at those stories, please do. But welcome to these unusual times. You know, I'd really like to tell you a story about where I'm living now. By the way, you may hear some people in the background because our house has become a place of work. There are people working all over this house now, so just listen to the stories and enjoy. The place where I live now starts with this story. Not many people know it. A young woman called Modwin left the Emerald Isle and with her two friends, Althea and Lazar, rowed across the boiling waters to England. This was at a time when the place was covered with forests that were wild boar, and at night, wolves that would howl to the moon. You see, Madwin was from a very rich family and her father wanted her to marry, but Madwin had said, I have fallen in love with the new religion, not with a man, except for Christ himself and what he has asked me to do. She became a nun. And she was on her way to Rome. But you see, as she came down through England, she stopped off and tasted the soft waters of the washlands. It was when she tasted those waters that she realised she wanted to stay in that spot and to build her monastery. That's what she did. This place is Staffordshire. And Bodwin stayed here for seven years. You know, it was those monks who began to brew with those beautiful waters that Bodwin first tasted and that there are many miracles attributed to. So much healing. After those seven years had passed, Marjorie remembered where she had intended to go and did make her way to Rome. But she came back from Rome and she ended up in, in her final years um, in Scotland near Dundee. And it's there that people saw as she passed to another life, two silver swans come down from heaven and lift her soul up to God. You know, if you want to see the story of Modwin, there's a church in Burton-on-Trent called St. Modwin and St. Mary, and there's a gorgeous stained glass window in that church that describes Modwin's story. So that's, that's where I am. And I know that these stories are going out all over the world and it's so lovely to connect with you all. Um, if you're ever in England, I think it's worth coming to the Washlands. The legacy of Modwin was that Burton-on-Trent became a great place of brewing. So you have Mr. Bass was here in the Victorian times. Bass breweries, Marsden breweries, Coors breweries are still here. And you know, we're right at the end of Lent now and I gave up the alcohol for Lent. So on this Easter Sunday, as I'm telling you stories, I will be celebrating with a glass of Guinness. And I hope you join me in that, <laughs> if you so wish. Just one little glass won't be of any harm, will it?
So I'm going to tell you some stories in this unusual time. Take you step by step. That's all we need to do. Go step by step, story by story. I want to tell you the story of the unluckiest man. He was fed up of being unlucky. He wanted to change his luck. So he thought, I am going to seek out the oracle, the wise woman. I'm going to change my luck. And he travelled for a day. He travelled for a week. He travelled for a month. And he travelled for a whole year and he came across a wolf, a sharp toothed wolf. But the strange thing about this wolf was it was nibbling away at a carrot. The unluckiest man saw the wolf and at first he was alarmed but when he saw he was nibbling at a carrot he talked to him and said uh, hello friend how are you doing there and the wolf said i'm not doing too badly where are you going the unluckiest man said i'm on my way to seek out the oracle the wise woman because i'm fed up of having such bad luck what about yourself well stay and i'll tell you said the wolf described himself as a vegetarian wolf and Asked the unluckiest man that if he found the oracle, could he tell her about him? Perhaps ask her some advice. And the unluckiest man said, of course, I shall, yes. He set off. He travelled for a day. He travelled for a week. He travelled for a month. He travelled for a whole year. And he was tired. And he came across a tree and it looked so sad. Its branches were limp. There were just two leaves dangling from the end of one of the branches. Its roots were poking out of the soil. And when the unluckiest man leant against that tree, the tree spoke to him. Oh. Hello, friend, it said. How are you doing? The unluckiest man said, oh, not great. I'm the unluckiest man. I want to change my luck. I'm on my way to seek out the oracle, the wise woman. Ask her advice. Oh, well, if you find her, said the tree, can you tell her about me? Ask some advice on my behalf. And the unluckiest man said, of course I can, I'll do that for you. And he travelled for a day, he travelled for a week, he travelled for a month, he travelled for a whole year. And he was feeling tired and he was feeling thirsty and hungry. So when he saw that great castle with the door wide open, he thought, I'll go inside. See what I can gain from this place. Is there anybody there? Said the unluckiest man as he stepped inside the glorious castle, which dazzled him as it glittered with gold. There was a great staircase in the centre of the castle. And shimmying down that staircase was a beautiful woman with long dark hair and glassy green eyes and she was weeping, sobbing. She sat down, beckoning the unluckiest man to sit with her. Can I help you, said the unluckiest man. <laughs> Who are you, she said. Why, I'm the unluckiest man. I I didn't mean to disturb you. I, I just saw the door was open. You see, I'm on my way to seek the oracle, the wise woman. I want to change my luck, he said. If you find her, 
can you tell her about me? Said the beautiful woman. I may be rich, but I'm so, so sad. And he stayed there for hours with that beautiful woman and promised her that when he found the oracle, he'd tell her all about her and ask her advice. And he left that place and he travelled for a day travelled for a week and he travelled for a month and he travelled for a whole year. And there, in a darkened cave, he found the oracle, the old wise woman, sitting with a shawl around her shoulders, she said. What is it you want from me? I am the unluckiest man, he said. And I'm fed up of having bad luck. I've been seeking you for so long. Please give me your advice. And the old wise woman gave her advice. And he said to her, Can I tell you about some of the, some of the creatures, the folk I've met along the way? She said, Indeed. And so he spent the night there listening to her advice all night long. And the next morning with a spring in his step, he set off. He walked for a day, a week, a month, a year. And, you know, he found himself back at that great castle and the door was open he remembered the beautiful young woman and he went inside and there she was sitting there you know she was still crying her eyes were red raw do you remember me he said i do she said did you find the wise woman i did he said did you ask advice for me and did you find out for yourself what you were to do yes said the unluckiest man who had been seeking to change his luck. Well, regarding you, said the unluckiest man, the wise woman gave you this advice. Okay, he said, now listen. She said, you're unhappy because you have no love in your life. And the next time you see a handsome young man, well, you to reach out to him. You to open your arms to him. And the young woman stopped crying. She looked across at him and she opened her arms and she said, Me, you, it's such good advice. And the unluckiest man said, Yes, and she said to me, that I'm to seize my opportunities. That's how I'll change my luck. And so the beautiful young woman smiled at him and she said, stay here with me then. And the man said, I'd love to, but I'm off to seek my opportunities. And he travelled for a day and he travelled for a week and he travelled for a month and he travelled for a whole year. He came back to that sad looking tree that had not changed except for one leaf. The other one had dropped off. Did you find, I said the tree, did you find the oracle I did? Said the man, yes, yes, yes. And I asked advice about you. You know, what the old woman said was, the reason why you can't grow and prosper properly is because you've got two great cases of gold underneath your roots. They need to be removed and then you'll grow well. Well, said the tree. There's a spade just behind me. Dig them out. Help yourself. Take them away with you. And the man said, well, I'd love to help, but I'm off to seek my opportunities. And he travelled for a day. He travelled for a week. <laughs> and he travelled for a month. And he travelled for a whole year. And he came back to the wolf with sharp teeth who was nibbling on a turnip when he found him. 
And the wolf said, ah, I, did you find the old woman, the oracle? Yes, yes, I did. And you know what she said? She gave me some advice for you. I've not forgotten it. She said, a vegetarian wolf, how ridiculous. Tell that wolf that the next time he sees a big, juicy piece of meat to eat it whole. And the wolf did. Oh yeah, I didn't tell you, did I, that originally I'm from Liverpool. So if you go back to the stories um, that I told a couple of weeks ago, um, I talk about, you know, I grew up in Liverpool, but I'm from a big Irish family. So many of the stories that I tell are Irish stories. And definitely before I finish today, I'll, I'll definitely throw in an Irish tale for you. But, you know, at the moment I'm thinking, I'm really missing the sea. I'm missing walking along a beach, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you a tale. Come with me on this one. Um, that's that's a sea-based tale. So together we can feel like we're there walking along that beach and hearing the sound of the sea. As the sea goes out of Bonnewit Bay, it leaves behind rock pools studded with starfish and limpets. And it was this beach that Joe would walk along every night after he had finished his fishing. It was a hard job and he loved to walk along there, just smoking his pipe, relaxing, reflecting, watching the amber sun go down. And on this evening he he heard a voice as he walked along. He couldn't tell where it was coming from and whether it was a, a child's voice or a woman's voice. But when he looked around, he couldn't see any human being. And he didn't know where to, where to seek out that voice from. He walked towards the voice, he thought, that seemed to be coming from somewhere along the beach from one of the rock pools, but all he could see was green seaweed. However, as he came closer to that rock pool, he realised that it wasn't strands of green seaweed he was looking at. He was looking at green hair. And that green hair was attached to a woman's head. And when he looked further down, he saw that it was just as well. The green hair was long because it was covering the naked torso of that woman. But as his eyes traveled further down, he saw that she didn't have a woman's hips and legs. She had a silver glistening fish's tail that curled around inside that rock pool. Her eyes were beautiful, like the sea them, they, themselves. And she was staring up at him and she said, please help me. And Joe said, I, I'd love to help you, but I know what creatures like you do to men like me. And he turned to, away and he, he went to walk away, but she pleaded with him, please, she said, if you don't help me, I'll die. Well, Joe had a good heart and he didn't like to see anybody in distress. And so, against his better judgment, he knelt down, he picked that woman up in his arms and carried her to the water's edge all the way. She talked to him softly. He went past the first wave, past the second wave, past the third wave. And he put her down into the salty water. 
And as he did, she said to him, If you ever need my help, take this, comb it through the sea three times and call for me. And when he looked in his hand, there was an amber comb. And the mermaid had disappeared under the waves. Well, you know, every day after that, when Joe went out fishing, every wave held her voice. He couldn't bear it. He gave up fishing. He bought a little cottage about a mile inland and spent his days sitting in front of the fire, watching the flame. But even then, in his cottage, when it rained and the rain tapped against his window pane, each raindrop held her voice gently. And when the rain fell on his roof in sheets, he could hear her voice calling him, Help me, help me, help me, Joe, Joe's there. One night, there was a great storm. The other fishermen had gone out to sea. The women and children had hoped for their return, had waited, had gone to the seashore, watched the boiling waves that rose like cathedrals and crashed down in ruins. But the men didn't come back. Then one of the women had an idea. Joe, he has a boat. He knows the sea. And so they ran to his house. They banged on his door and they asked him for help. And Joe, being a good-hearted man, agreed and said, I will, I'll, I'll come and help you. But before he left his house, he took from a drawer an amber comb and put it in his pocket. That night, Joe pulled his boat a mile across dry land and then into the sea, past the first wave, past the second wave, Past the third wave, he found each one of those drowning fishermen, pulled them into his boat. One of the women said later that she was sure she saw a woman pulling the drowning fisherman towards Joseph's boat, helping him bring those men into his boat and back to dry land. That night, Joe saved each and every one of those fishermen. The women said to him, Joe, we can't thank you enough. Come and celebrate with us. Come and have food and drink. Thank you for saving Daddy, said the children. But Joe just shook his head. And when they went off to celebrate, he stayed there on the seashore and then pushed his boat out into the sea. There was one young girl who had stayed with her lamp held high, who claimed later that this is what she saw. But Joe passed the first wave and the second wave and the third wave. And then a woman with long green hair emerged from the waters, her arms beckoning to Joe. And Joe slipped down under the water with her and was never seen again. You know, some people believe that that night Joe lost his life. He gave himself in return for all the men he'd saved. But others say that that night, Joe 
found the love of his life and is still there under the waters, happy with his mermaid bride. Can you smell the salty sea waters? Mm. Let's go step by small step together. Let me tell you one of my favourite stories that my dad told me. This story begins with Finn McCool. I told you some other Finn stories um, last week. Go back, watch them. You know, if you've a penny or two, please go to um, my page. There's a facility there where you can put some money in if you wish. These are hard times for storytellers and artists generally. In fact, it's a hard time for us all. However, if you can't afford anything, completely understand. If you can, do. So Finn and his beloved son, Asheen, which I think I might have told you means little deer, are standing at a cliff edge, right on the edge of Ireland, looking out to sea. You see, they're part of the Fianna, so they're protecting Ireland, looking out for invaders, ready to call for help from their warriors. And Finn says to his handsome son, Sheen, Son, look, they're coming. There's a ship. No, father, says Asheen. I don't think you realise how old you've got. Your eyes aren't as good as they were. That is no ship. That, father, is a beautiful woman. Look, and it was. A woman with long golden hair on the back of a white stallion. And she was galloping that horse through the sea, which had parted and become walls of water. And then the horse began to ride the air and landed right next to Asheen and Finn. And the men were dazzled by her. She dismounted from that stallion. And the stallion was glittering in the sunshine. Its hooves were silver. The saddle was studded around the edge with red rubies. And she stood before the two men who bowed to her. And they said, Madam, may we help you? And she said, yes, you can help me, for I have come looking for my husband. Then we'll find him for you, said Asheen and Finn. There is no need said Neve of the golden hair, for that's who she was. I have found him. He is right here. And she looked directly at Asheen. You will be my husband, if you wish. And come back with me to the land of Tian and Nog, Nog that we can rule together. Now, <laughs> Asheen, was so happy in that moment because she was gorgeous and she had dignity. And he was already falling in love with her. <sighs> um, yes, I, I, I'll, I'll come with you. She looked at him, this great warrior, this great poet and storyteller. And she smiled and they bonded with each other in that moment. Come, she said, come on to the back of my horse with me. We'll go together. And he jumped up as quick as anything onto the back of that horse. But before he left with that lovely woman, that magical woman, he stopped and he turned 
and he looked at his dad, Finn McCool, and he said, Oh, father, goodbye, but I, I, I will return. Finn knew that this was the moment that we all experience, that moment when we grow up, when we become adults. And we go to live our own lives and say goodbye to our parents. And that's, that's how things are. And Finn said, son, you have my blessing. And he waved. And the sheen waved. And that horse galloped to the edge of the cliff and galloped through the air. And down it went into the waters and the waters parted. And they galloped and galloped. And Sheen saw those shimmering watery walls and the horse began to ride the air. And for three whole days, that magical horse galloped through the clouds. Until they came to the golden gates of Tir Nanod. And the gates began to open. And carrying on the soft breeze was a sound that Ashin had never heard before. It was the sound of people singing in harmony. It was beautiful. The sound of a harp playing. And he saw a host of young people who were smiling, welcoming him inside. And as he walked into the land of eternal youth, Tir Nanod, he saw that all the castles there the glittering gold, all the fields were full of flowers. You know, he was in love with me and he had everything he wanted. If he was hungry, he'd only have to think of the food he wished for and it would be there in front of him a feast. If he was tired, he'd only have to close his eyes and rest his head and a, a pillow stuffed with soft feathers would appear. Everything he wanted was right there for him whenever he wanted it. But you know, Asheen was a warrior and he was an adventurer and If you have everything you want, whenever you want it, you might start to get a little bit bored. Machine did. He was full of the love of need, but he wanted to do good. And he said to his wife, it's not just that, my love, but I miss my dad. I want to go back to Ireland just to see him, to see his face. And she said, I love you so I let you go. Take my horse. Just promise me that you will not set foot on Irish soil. Stay on the horse and you will be safe. And she kissed him passionately. And he left Tien and Ode, the golden gates opening, and once more he was in the clouds. And the horse was riding, riding, down it went, and the waters parted for them. And he rode through those watery walls and up 
into the air and down onto the cliff edge, and they galloped and galloped and galloped. Something was different, though. The green world of Ireland seemed greyer. And when they reached the castle of Tara, where Finn had lived, what Asheen found was simply ruins. Asheen couldn't understand what was happening. He heard some men in the distance and he turned. There were four men carrying a great marble slab, struggling with it they were. Asheen turned to them and he shouted across and he said, Excuse me, um, I've come to see my father. Do you know him? His name is Finn McCool. <laughs> they began to laugh. One of them shouted across and said, Finn McCool, he died 300 years ago. Oh, Sheen's heart sank. You see, what he thought was three months that had passed was in fact three hundred years. Anyway, you're a fine looking fella. Come and help us. Come and help us with this slab. And Asheen, always wanting to help, trotted across on the horse and he leaned down to help them. But in that moment, the buckle underneath the saddle snapped and the saddle slipped and a sheen fell, and his body touched Irish soil. And within that moment, a sheen's eyes began to grow opaque. They were no longer as blue as a summer sky, and around the edges they were red and roomy, his young face grew wrinkled, his blonde hair turned white. And within seconds, he had grown a white, long beard, his back, his back curved. It was no longer strong, his fingers were arthritic and gnarled, and he was gasping. He had grown old, 300 years old. And the men seeing this, well, they felt such sympathy for this old, old man. One of them picked him up and carried him into the church. And in that church, there was a priest. And they put a sheen into his arms, and that priest was called Patrick. And you might know him as Saint Patrick, the patron saint of Ireland. And it was Patrick who looked after a sheen. Before he passed into the next world, a sheen whispered into Patrick's ears all the old stories, all the stories of the Fianna, of his dad, Finn McCool, and all his adventures. He told him all the stories of the Tour de Danon and the old, old world. And it was peaceful, that passing. And Patrick told the stories to his monks. And the monks told those stories to the people. And the people told the stories to their children. And the children grew up and told the stories to their children. And they grew up and told the stories to their children. And they grew up and told the stories to their children. And, the to their children. and the stories came to me. And I give these stories to you on this Sunday, Easter Sunday, 
And, you know, if you wish to, tell them again to your children or to your friends. And I want to say to you all, enjoy these tales. I hope they bring you some entertainment. And right at this time, um, it being Easter Sunday, it is a time of hope, isn't it? Traditionally, it's a time of hope. And we take one step at a time, one story at a time. And I'd like to wish you, before I go, um, all the best. May the road rise to meet you. And a final cheers to Modwin, who came here all those years ago and started the brewing industry. Because I think it's time for me now to go away and celebrate with a little tipple. I hope to see you again very soon and tell you some more stories and enjoy all the other tellers here from all around the world. Aren't they just fantastic? God bless. <laughs> Bye from Maria. See you soon. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just been listening to the most magnificent storyteller. And just like if you come into a pub or a bar, if you happen to be in America, and they haven't, there's no door charge, but there's a tip jar or there's a hat, we'd really appreciate it. Because our tellers, you know, they've got no way to earn at the moment. We'd really appreciate it if you could reach into your pocket and you could drop a little something into the hat. And to do that, you have to go to the website, World Storytelling Cafe. <laughs>